Book Three, Chapter Two, Part Two of Two of The Beautiful and Damned. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Beautiful and Damned by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Book Three, Chapter Two A Matter of Aesthetics. Part Two of Two. Further Adventures with Heart Talks. With an accompaniment of ironic laughter, Anthony told Gloria the story of his commercial adventure, but she listened without amusement. "'You're going to give up again?' she demanded coldly. "'Why, you don't expect me to. I never expected anything of you.' He hesitated. "'Well, I can't see the slightest benefit in laughing myself sick over this sort of affair. If there's anything older than the old story, it's the new twist.' It required an astonishing amount of moral energy on Gloria's part to intimidate him into returning, and when he reported the next day, somewhat depressed from his perusal of the senile bromides skittishly set forth in Heart Talks on Ambition, he found only fifty of the original three hundred awaiting the appearance of the vital and compelling Sammy Carlton. Mr. Carlton's powers of vitality and compulsion were, this time, exercised in elucidating that magnificent piece of speculation, how to sell. It seemed that the approved method was to state one's proposition, and then to say, not, and now will you buy. This was not the way. Oh, no. The way was to state one's proposition, and then, having reduced one's adversary to a state of exhaustion, to deliver oneself of the categorical imperative, Now see here, you've taken up my time explaining this matter to you, you've admitted my points, all I want to ask is how many do you want? As Mr. Carlton piled assertion upon assertion, Anthony began to feel a sort of disgusted confidence in him. The man appeared to know what he was talking about. Obviously prosperous, he had risen to the position of instructing others. It did not occur to Anthony that the type of man who attains commercial success seldom knows how or why, and, as in his grandfather's case, when he ascribes reasons, the reasons are generally inaccurate and absurd. Anthony noted that, of the numerous old men who had answered the original advertisement, only two had returned, and that among the thirty-odd who assembled on the third day to get actual selling instructions from Mr. Carlton, only one gray head was in evidence. These thirty were eager converts. With their mouths, they followed the working of Mr. Carlton's mouth. They swayed in their seats with enthusiasm, and in the intervals of his talk they spoke to each other in tense, approving whispers. Yet of the chosen few who, in the words of Mr. Carlton, were determined to get those desserts that rightly and truly belonged to them, Less than half a dozen combined even a modicum of personal appearance with that great gift of being a pusher. But they were told that they were all natural pushers. It was merely necessary that they should believe with a sort of savage passion in what they were selling. He even urged each one to buy some stock himself, if possible, in order to increase his own sincerity. On the fifth day, then, Anthony sallied into the street with all the sensations of a man wanted by the police. Acting according to instructions, he selected a tall office building in order that he might ride to the top story and work downward, stopping in every office that had a name on the door. But at the last minute he hesitated. Perhaps it would be more practicable to acclimate himself to the chilly atmosphere which he felt was awaiting him by trying a few offices on, say, Madison Avenue. He went into an arcade that seemed only semi-prosperous, and, seeing a sign which read, Percy B. Weatherby, Architect, he opened the door heroically and entered. A starchy young woman looked up questioningly. "'Can I see Mr. Weatherby?' He wondered if his voice sounded tremulous. She laid her hand tentatively on the telephone receiver. "'What's the name, please?' "'He wouldn't, uh, know me. He wouldn't know my name.' "'What's your business with him? You an insurance agent?' "'Oh, no, nothing like that,' denied Anthony hurriedly. "'Oh, no, it's a, it's a personal matter.' He wondered if he should have said this. It had all sounded so simple when Mr. Carlton had enjoined his flock. "'Don't allow yourself to be kept out. Show them you've made up your mind to talk to them, and they'll listen.' 
The girl succumbed to Anthony's pleasant, melancholy face, and in a moment the door to the inner room opened and admitted a tall, splay-footed man with slicked hair. He approached Anthony with ill-concealed impatience. "'You wanted to see me on a personal matter?' Anthony quailed. "'I wanted to talk to you,' he said defiantly. "'About what? It'll take some time to explain. Well, what's it about?' Mr. Weatherby's voice indicated rising irritation. Then Anthony, straining at each word, each syllable, began, I don't know whether or not you've ever heard of a series of pamphlets called Heart Talks. Good grief, cried Percy B. Weatherby, architect. Are you trying to touch my heart? No, it's business. Heart Talks have been incorporated, and we're putting some shares on the market. His voice faded slowly off harassed by a fixed and contemptuous stare from his unwilling prey. For another minute he struggled on, increasingly sensitive and tangled in his own words. His confidence oozed from him in great retching emanations that seemed to be sections of his own body. Almost mercifully, Percy B. Weatherby, architect, terminated the interview. "'Good grief!' he exploded in disgust. "'And you call that a personal matter!' He whipped about and strode into his private office, banging the door behind him. Not daring to look at the stenographer, Anthony, in some shameful and mysterious way, got himself from the room. Perspiring profusely, he stood in the hall wondering why they didn't come and arrest him. In every hurried look he discerned infallibly a glance of scorn. After an hour, and with the help of two strong whiskies, he brought himself up to another attempt. He walked into a plumber's shop, but when he mentioned his business, the plumber began pulling on his coat in a great hurry, gruffly announcing that he had to go to lunch. Anthony remarked politely that it was futile to try and sell a man anything when he was hungry, and the plumber heartily agreed. This episode encouraged Anthony. He tried to think that, had the plumber not been bound for lunch, he would at least have listened. Passing by a few glittering and formidable bazaars, he entered a grocery store. A talkative proprietor told him that, before buying any stocks, he was going to see how the armistice affected the market. To Anthony this seemed almost unfair. In Mr. Carlton's salesman's utopia, the only reason prospective buyers ever gave for not purchasing stock was that they doubted it to be a promising investment. Obviously, a man in that state was almost ludicrously easy game, to be brought down merely by the judicious application of the correct selling points. But these men, why, actually, they weren't considering buying anything at all. Anthony took several more drinks before he approached his fourth man, a real estate agent. Nevertheless, he was floored with a coup, as decisive as a syllogism. The real estate agent said that he had three brothers in the investment business. Viewing himself as a breaker-up of homes, Anthony apologized and went out. After another drink, he conceived the brilliant plan of selling the stock to the bartenders along Lexington Avenue. This occupied several hours, for it was necessary to take a few drinks in each place in order to get the proprietor in the proper frame of mind to talk business. But the bartenders, one and all, contended that, if they had any money to buy bonds, they would not be bartenders. It was as though they had all convened and decided upon that rejoinder. As he approached a dark and soggy five o'clock, he found that they were developing a still more annoying tendency to turn him off with a jest. At five, then, with a tremendous effort at concentration, he decided that he must put more variety into his canvassing. He selected a medium-sized delicatessen store and went in. He felt, illuminatingly, that the thing to do was to cast a spell not only over the storekeeper, but over all the customers as well, and perhaps through the psychology of the herd instinct they would buy as an astounded and immediately convinced whole. Afternoon, he began in a loud, thick voice. Got a little proposition. If he had wanted silence, he obtained it. A sort of awe descended upon the half-dozen women marketing, and upon the gray-haired ancient who, in cap and apron, was slicing chicken. Anthony pulled a batch of papers from his flopping briefcase and waved them cheerfully. "'Buy a bond,' he suggested. "'Good as Liberty Bond!' The phrase pleased him, and he elaborated upon it. 
Better in Liberty Bond. Each one of these bonds worth two Liberty Bonds. His mind made a hiatus and skipped to his peroration, which he delivered with appropriate gestures, these being somewhat marred by the necessity of clinging to the counter with one or both hands. Now see here, are you taking up my time? I don't want no why you won't buy. I just want you say why. Want you say how many. At this point, they should have approached him with checkbooks and fountain pens in hand. Realizing that they must have missed a cue, Anthony, with the instincts of an actor, went back and repeated his finale. Now see here, you take it up my time, you file a proposition, you agree the reasoning, now all I want from you is how many liberty bonds? See here, broke in a new voice, a portly man whose face was adorned with symmetrical scrolls of yellow hair had come out of a glass cage in the rear of the store and was bearing down upon Anthony. See here, you. How many? repeated the salesman sternly. You taken up my time. Hey, you, cried the proprietor. I'll have you taken up by the police. You most certainly won't, retorted Anthony with fine defiance. All I want to know is how many. From here and there in the store went up little clouds of comment and expostulation. How terrible. He's a raving maniac. He's disgracefully drunk. The proprietor grasped Anthony's arm sharply. Get out, or I'll call a policeman. Some relics of rationality moved Anthony to nod and replace his bonds clumsily in the case. How many? He reiterated doubtfully. The whole force, if necessary, thundered his adversary, his yellow mustache trembling fiercely. Sell them all a bond. With this, Anthony turned, bowed gravely to his late auditors, and wobbled from the store. He found a taxicab at the corner and rode home to the apartment. There he fell sound asleep on the sofa, and so Gloria found him, his breath filling the air with an unpleasant pungency, his hand still clutching his open briefcase. Except when Anthony was drinking, his range of sensation had become less than that of a healthy old man and when prohibition came in July, he found that, among those who could afford it, there was more drinking than ever before. One's host now brought out a bottle upon the slightest pretext. The tendency to display liquor was a manifestation of the same instinct that led a man to deck his wife with jewels. To have liquor was a boast, almost a badge of respectability. In the mornings, Anthony awoke, tired, nervous, and worried. Halcyon summer twilights and the purple chill of morning alike left him unresponsive. Only for a brief moment every day in the warmth and renewed life of a first highball did his mind turn to those opalescent dreams of future pleasure, the mutual heritage of the happy and the damned. But this was only for a little while. As he grew drunker, the dreams faded, and he became a confused specter, moving in odd crannies of his own mind, full of unexpected devices harshly contemptuous at best, and reaching sodden and dispirited depths. One night in June he had quarreled violently with Maury over a matter of the utmost triviality. He remembered dimly next morning that it had been about a broken pint bottle of champagne. Maury had told him to sober up, and Anthony's feelings had been hurt. So, with an attempted gesture of dignity, he had risen from the table and, seizing Gloria's arm, half led, half shamed her into a taxicab outside, leaving Maury with three dinners ordered and tickets for the opera. This sort of semi-tragic fiasco had become so usual that, when they occurred, he was no longer stirred into making amends. If Gloria protested, and of late she was more likely to sink into a contemptuous silence, he would either engage in a bitter defense of himself or else stalk dismally from the apartment. Never, since the incident on the station platform at Redgate, had he laid his hands on her in anger, though he was withheld often only by some instinct that itself made him tremble with rage. Just as he still cared for her more than for any other creature, so did he more intensely and frequently hate her. So far, the judges of the appellate division had failed to hand down a decision, but after another postponement, they finally affirmed the decree of the lower court, two justices dissenting. A notice of appeal was served upon Edward Shuttleworth. 
The case was going to the court of last resort, and they were in for another interminable wait, six months, perhaps a year. It had grown enormously unreal to them, remote and uncertain as heaven. Throughout the previous winter one small matter had been a subtle and omnipresent irritant, the question of Gloria's grey fur coat. At that time women, enveloped in long squirrel wraps, could be seen every few yards along Fifth Avenue. The women were converted to the shape of tops. They seemed porcine and obscene. They resembled kept women in the concealing richness, the feminine animality of the garment. Yet Gloria wanted a grey squirrel coat. Discussing the matter, or rather arguing it, for even more than in the first year of their marriage did every discussion take the form of bitter debate, full of such phrases as, most certainly, utterly outrageous, it's so, nevertheless, and the ultra-emphatic, regardless, they concluded that they could not afford it. And so gradually it began to stand as a symbol of their growing financial anxiety. To Gloria, the shrinkage of their income was a remarkable phenomenon, without explanation or precedent, that it could happen at all within the space of five years seemed almost an intended cruelty, conceived and executed by a sardonic god. When they were married, seventy-five hundred a year had seemed ample for a young couple, especially when augmented by the expectation of many millions. Gloria had failed to realize that it was decreasing not only in amount, but in purchasing power, until the payment of Mr. Haight's retaining fee of fifteen thousand dollars made the fact suddenly and startlingly obvious. When Anthony was drafted, they had calculated their income at over four hundred a month, with a dollar even then decreasing in value. But on his return to New York, they discovered an even more alarming condition of affairs. They were receiving only forty-five hundred a year from their investments and though the suit over the will moved ahead of them like a persistent mirage, and the financial danger mark loomed up in the near distance, they found, nevertheless, that living within their income was impossible. So Gloria went without the squirrel coat, and every day upon Fifth Avenue she was a little conscious of her well-worn, half-length leopard skin, now hopelessly old-fashioned. Every other month they sold a bond, Yet when the bills were paid, it left only enough to be gulped down hungrily by their current expenses. Anthony's calculations showed that their capital would last about seven years longer. So Gloria's heart was very bitter, for in one week, on a prolonged hysterical party, during which Anthony whimsically divested himself of coat, vest, and shirt in a theater, and was assisted out by a posse of ushers, they spent twice what the gray squirrel coat would have cost. It was November. Indian summer, rather, and a warm, warm night, which was unnecessary, for the work of the summer was done. Babe Ruth had smashed the home run record for the first time, and Jack Dempsey had broken Jess Willard's cheekbone out in Ohio. Over in Europe, the usual number of children had swollen stomachs from starvation, and the diplomats were at their customary business of making the world safe for new wars. In New York City, the proletariat were being disciplined and the odds on Harvard were generally quoted at five to three. Peace had come down in earnest, the beginning of new days. Up in the bedroom of the apartment on 57th Street, Gloria lay upon her bed and tossed from side to side, sitting up at intervals to throw off a superfluous cover, and once asking Anthony, who was lying awake beside her, to bring her a glass of ice water. Be sure and put ice in it, she said with insistence. It isn't cold enough the way it comes from the faucet. Looking through the frail curtains, she could see the rounded moon over the roofs, and beyond it, on the sky, the yellow glow from Times Square. And watching the two incongruous lights, her mind worked over an emotion, or rather, an interwoven complex of emotions, that had occupied it through the day and the day before that, and back to the last time when she could remember having thought clearly and consecutively about anything which must have been while Anthony was in the army. She would be twenty-nine in February. The month assumed an ominous and inescapable significance, making her wonder, through these nebulous half-fevered hours, whether after all she had not wasted her faintly tired beauty, whether there was such a thing as use for any quality bounded by a harsh and inevitable mortality. Years before, when she was twenty-one, she had written in her diary, Beauty is only to be admired, only to be loved, to be harvested carefully, 
and then flung at a chosen lover like a gift of roses. It seems to me, so far as I can judge clearly at all, that my beauty should be used like that. And now, all this November day, all this desolate day, under a sky dirty and white, Clara had been thinking that perhaps she had been wrong. To preserve the integrity of her first gift, she had looked no more for love. When the first flame and ecstasy had grown dim, sunk down, departed, she had begun preserving what? It puzzled her that she no longer knew just what she was preserving, a sentimental memory or some profound and fundamental concept of honor. She was doubting now whether there had been any moral issue involved in her way of life, to walk unworried and unregretful along the gayest of all possible lanes, and to keep her pride by being always herself and doing what it seemed beautiful that she should do. From the first little boy in an Eton collar whose girl she had been, down to the latest casual man whose eyes had grown alert and appreciative as they rested upon her, there was needed only that matchless candor she could throw into a look or clothe with an inconsequent clause, for she had always talked in broken clauses, to weave about her immeasurable illusions, immeasurable distances, immeasurable light, to create souls in men, to create fine happiness and fine despair, she must remain deeply proud, proud to be inviolate, proud also to be melting, to be passionate and possessed. She knew that in her breast she had never wanted children. The reality, the earthiness, the intolerable sentiment of childbearing, the menace to her beauty, had appalled her. She wanted to exist only as a conscious flower, prolonging and preserving itself. Her sentimentality could cling fiercely to her own illusions, but her ironic soul whispered that motherhood was also the privilege of the female baboon. So her dreams were of ghostly children only, the early, the perfect symbols of her early and perfect love for Anthony. In the end, then, her beauty was all that had never failed her. She had never seen beauty like her own. What it meant ethically or aesthetically faded before the gorgeous concreteness of her pink and white feet, the clean perfectness of her body, and the baby mouth that was like the material symbol of a kiss. She would be twenty-nine in February. As the long night waned, she grew supremely conscious that she and Beauty were going to make use of these next three months. At first she was not sure for what, but the problem resolved itself gradually into the old lure of the screen. She was in earnest now. No material want could have moved her as this fear moved her. No matter for Anthony, Anthony, the poor in spirit, the weak and broken man with bloodshot eyes, for whom she still had moments of tenderness, no matter. She would be twenty-nine in February, a hundred days, so many days. She would go to Blockman tomorrow. With the decision came relief. It cheered her that in some manner the illusion of beauty could be sustained, or preserved, perhaps, in celluloid, after the reality had vanished. Well, tomorrow. The next day she felt weak and ill. She tried to go out, and saved herself from collapse only by clinging to a mailbox near the front door. The Martinique elevator boy helped her upstairs, and she waited on the bed for Anthony's return without energy to unhook her brassiere. For five days she was down with influenza, which, just as the month turned corner into winter, ripened into double pneumonia. In the feverish perambulations of her mind she prowled through a house of bleak, unlighted rooms hunting for her mother. All she wanted was to be a little girl to be efficiently taken care of by some yielding but superior power, stupider and steadier than herself. It seemed that the only lover she had ever wanted was a lover in a dream. Odi Profanum Vulgus One day, in the midst of Gloria's illness, there occurred a curious incident that puzzled Miss McGovern, the trained nurse, for some time afterward. It was noon, but the room in which the patient lay was dark and quiet. Miss McGovern was standing near the bed, mixing some medicine, when Mrs. Patch, who had apparently been sound asleep, sat up and began to speak vehemently. "'Millions of people,' she said, "'swarming like rats, chattering like apes, smelling like all hell, monkeys, or lice, I suppose, for one really exquisite palace on Long Island, say, or even in Greenwich.' for one palace full of pictures from the old world, and exquisite things, 
with avenues of trees and green lawns and a view of the blue sea and lovely people about in slick dresses, I'd sacrifice a hundred thousand of them, a million of them. She raised her hand feebly and snapped her fingers. I care nothing for them, understand me? The look she bent upon Miss McGovern at the conclusion of this speech was curiously elfin, curiously content. Then she gave a short little laugh, polished with scorn, and tumbling backward, fell off again to sleep. Miss McGovern was bewildered. She wondered what were the hundred thousand things that Mrs. Patch would sacrifice for her palace. Dollars, she supposed. Yet it had not sounded exactly like dollars. THE MOVIES It was February, seven days before her birthday, and the great snow that had filled up the cross streets as dirt fills the cracks in a floor had turned to slush and was being escorted to the gutters by the hoses of the street-cleaning department. The wind, none the less bitter for being casual, whipped in through the open windows of the living room, bearing with it the dismal secrets of the areaway and clearing the patch apartment of stale smoke in its cheerless circulation. Gloria, wrapped in a warm kimono, came into the chilly room and, taking up the telephone receiver, called Joseph Blackman. "'Do you mean Mr. Joseph Black?' demanded the telephone girl at Films Par Excellence. "'Blockman, Joseph Blackman, B-L-O. Mr. Joseph Blackman has changed his name to Black. Do you want him?' "'What? Yes.' She remembered nervously that she had once called him Blockhead to his face. His office was reached by courtesy of two additional female voices. The last was a secretary who took her name. Only with the flow through the transmitter of his own familiar but faintly impersonal tone did she realize that it had been three years since they had met, and he had changed his name to Black. "'Can you see me?' she suggested lightly. "'It's on a business matter, really. I'm going into the movies at last, if I can.' "'I'm awfully glad. I've always thought you'd like it. Do you think you can get me a trial?' she demanded, with the arrogance peculiar to all beautiful women, to all women who have ever at any time considered themselves beautiful. He assured her that it was merely a question of when she wanted the trial. Any time? Well, he'd phone later in the day and let her know a convenient hour. The conversation closed with conventional padding on both sides. Then from three o'clock to five she sat close to the telephone, with no result. But next morning came a note that contented and excited her. My dear Gloria, just by luck a matter came to my attention that I think will be just suited to you. I would like to see you start with something that would bring you notice. At the same time, if a very beautiful girl of your sort is put directly into a picture, next to one of the rather shop-worn stars with which every company is afflicted, tongues would very likely wag. But there is a flapper part in a Percy B. Debris production that I think would be just suited to you and would bring you notice. Willis Sable plays opposite Gaston Mears in a sort of character part, and your part, I believe, would be her younger sister. Anyway, Percy B. Debris, who is directing the picture, says, if you'll come to the studios day after tomorrow, Thursday, he will run off a test. If ten o'clock is suited to you, I will meet you there at that time. With all good wishes, ever faithfully, Joseph Black. Gloria had decided that Anthony was to know nothing of this until she had obtained a definite position, and accordingly she was dressed and out of the apartment next morning before he awoke. Her mirror had given her, she thought, much the same account as ever. She wondered if there were any lingering traces of her sickness. She was still slightly underweight, and she had fancied, a few days before, that her cheeks were a trifle thinner. But she felt that those were merely transitory conditions, and that on this particular day she looked as fresh as ever. She had bought and charged a new hat, and as the day was warm she had left the leopard-skin coat at home. At the Films Par Excellence Studios, she was announced over the telephone and told that Mr. Black would be down directly. She looked around her. Two girls were being shown about by a little fat man in a slash-pocket coat, and one of them had indicated a stack of thin parcels, piled breast-high against the wall and extending along for twenty feet. That studio mail, explained the fat man, pictures of the stars who are with films par excellence. Oh, each one's autographed by Florence Kelly or Gaston Mears or Mac Dodge, he winked confidentially. 
At least when Minnie McGluck out in Sock Center gets the picture she wrote for, she thinks it's autographed. Just a stamp? Sure. It'd take him a good eight-hour day to autograph half of them. They say Mary Pickford's studio mail costs her fifty thousand a year. Say. Sure, fifty thousand. But it's the best kind of advertising there is. They drifted out of earshot, and almost immediately Blockman appeared. Blockman, a dark, suave gentleman, gracefully engaged in the middle forties, who greeted her with courteous warmth, and told her she had not changed a bit in three years. He led the way into a great hall, as large as an armory, and broken intermittently, with busy sets and blinding rows of unfamiliar light. Each piece of scenery was marked in large white letters, Gaston Mears Company, Mac Dodge Company, or simply, Films par excellence. Ever been in a studio before? Never have. She liked it. There was no heavy closeness of grease paint, no scent of soiled and tawdry costumes, which years before had revolted her behind the scenes of a musical comedy. This work was done in the clean mornings. The appurtenances seemed rich and gorgeous and new. On a set that was joyous with Manchu hangings, a perfect Chinaman was going through a scene according to megaphone directions, as the great glittering machine ground out its ancient moral tale for the edification of the national mind. A red-headed man approached them and spoke with familiar deference to Blockman, who answered, "'Hello, Debris. Want you to meet Mrs. Patch. Mrs. Patch wants to go into pictures, as I explained to you. All right, now, where do we go?' Mr. Debris, the great Percy B. Debris, thought Gloria, showed them to a set which represented the interior of an office. Some chairs were drawn up around the camera, which stood in front of it, and the three of them sat down. "'Ever been in a studio before?' asked Mr. Debris, giving her a glance that was surely the quintessence of keenness. "'No? Well, I'll explain exactly what's going to happen. We're going to take what we call a test in order to see how your features photograph and whether you've got natural stage presence and how you respond to coaching. There's no need to be nervous over it. I'll just have the cameraman take a few hundred feet in an episode I've got marked here in the scenario. We can tell pretty much what we want to from that.' He produced a typewritten continuity and explained to her the episode she was to enact. It developed that one Barbara Wainwright had been secretly married to the junior partner of the firm whose office was there represented. Entering the deserted office one day by accident, she was naturally interested in seeing where her husband worked. The telephone rang and after some hesitation she answered it. She learned that her husband had been struck by an automobile and instantly killed. She was overcome. At first she was unable to realize the truth, but finally she succeeded in comprehending it and went into a dead faint on the floor. "'Now that's all we want,' concluded Mr. Debris. "'I'm going to stand here and tell you approximately what to do, and you're to act as though I wasn't here, and just go on and do it your own way. You needn't be afraid we're going to judge this too severely. We simply want to get a general idea of your screen personality.' "'I see.' You'll find makeup in the room in back of the set. Go light on it, very little red. I see, repeated Gloria, nodding. She touched her lips nervously with the tip of her tongue. The test. As she came into the set through the real wooden door and closed it carefully behind her, she found herself inconveniently dissatisfied with her clothes. She should have brought a Mrs. dress for the occasion. She could still wear them, and it might have been a good investment if it had accentuated her airy youth. Her mind snapped sharply into the momentous present as Mr. Debris's voice came from the glare of the white lights in front. You look around for your husband. Now, you don't see him. You're curious about the office. She became conscious of the regular sound of the camera. It worried her. She glanced toward it involuntarily and wondered if she had made up her face correctly. Then, with a definite effort, she forced herself to act, and she had never felt that the gestures of her body were so banal, so awkward, so bereft of grace or distinction. She strolled around the office, picking up articles here and there, and looking at them inanely. Then she scrutinized the ceiling, the floor, and thoroughly inspected an inconsequential lead pencil on the desk. Finally, because she could think of nothing else to do, and less than nothing to express, 
She forced a smile. All right. Now the phone rings. ting a ling a ling Hesitate, and then answer it. She hesitated, and then, too quickly, she thought, picked up the receiver. Hello? Her voice was hollow and unreal. The words rang in the empty set like the ineffectualities of a ghost. The absurdities of their requirements appalled her. Did they expect that, on an instant's notice, she could put herself in the place of this preposterous and unexplained character? No, no, not yet. Now, listen, John Sumner has been knocked over by an automobile and instantly killed. Gloria let her baby mouth drop slowly open. Then, now hang up, with a bang. She obeyed, clung to the table with her eyes wide and staring. At length she was feeling slightly encouraged, and her confidence increased. "'My God!' she cried. Her voice was good, she thought. "'Oh, my God!' Now faint. She collapsed forward to her knees, and throwing her body outward on the ground, lay without breathing. "'All right,' called Mr. Debris. "'That's enough. Thank you. That's plenty. Get up. That's enough.' Gloria arose, mustering her dignity and brushing off her skirt. Awful, she remarked with a cool laugh, though her heart was bumping tumultuously. Terrible, wasn't it? Did you mind it? said Mr. Debris, smiling blandly. Did it seem hard? I can't tell anything about it until I have it run off. Of course not, she agreed, trying to attach some sort of meaning to his remark, and failing. It was just the sort of thing he would have said had he been trying not to encourage her. A few moments later she left the studio. Blockman had promised her that she should hear the result of the test within the next few days. Too proud to force any definite comment, she felt a baffling uncertainty, and only now, when the step had at last been taken, did she realize how the possibility of a successful screen career had played in the back of her mind for the past three years. That night she tried to tell over to herself the elements that might decide for or against her. Whether or not she had used enough makeup worried her, and, as the part was that of a girl of twenty, she wondered if she had not been just a little too grave. About her acting she was least of all satisfied. Her entrance had been abominable. In fact, not until she reached the phone had she displayed a shred of poise, and then the test had been over. If they had only realized, she wished that she could try it again. A mad plan to call up in the morning and ask for a new trial took possession of her, and as suddenly faded. It seemed neither politic nor polite to ask another favor of Blockman. The third day of waiting found her in a highly nervous condition. She had bitten the insides of her mouth until they were raw and smarting, and burnt unbearably when she washed them with Listerine. She had quarreled so persistently with Anthony that he had left the apartment in a cold fury. But because he was intimidated by her exceptional frigidity, he called up an hour afterward, apologized, and said he was having dinner at the Amsterdam Club, the only one in which he still retained membership. It was after one o'clock, and she had breakfasted at eleven, so, deciding to forego luncheon, she started for a walk in the park. At three there would be a mail. She would be back by three. It was an afternoon of premature spring. Water was drying on the walks, and in the park little girls were gravely wheeling white doll buggies up and down under the thin trees, while behind them followed bored nursery maids in twos, discussing with each other those tremendous secrets that are peculiar to nursery maids. Two o'clock by her little gold watch. She should have a new watch, one made in a platinum oblong and encrusted with diamonds. But those cost even more than squirrel coats, and of course they were out of their reach now, like everything else. Unless, perhaps, the right letter was awaiting her, in about an hour, fifty-eight minutes exactly, ten to get there, left forty-eight, forty-seven now. Little girls soberly wheeling their buggies along the damp sunny walks, the nursery maids chattering in pairs about their inscrutable secrets, here and there a raggedy man seated upon newspapers, spread on a drying bench, related not to the radiant and delightful afternoon, but to the dingy snow that slept exhausted in obscure corners, waiting for extermination. Ages later, 
Coming into the dim hall, she saw the Martinique elevator boy standing incongruously in the light of the stained-glass window. "'Is there any mail for us?' she asked. "'Upstairs, madame.' The switchboard squawked abominably, and Gloria waited while he ministered to the telephone. She sickened as the elevator groaned its way up. The floors passed like the slow lapse of centuries, each one ominous, accusing, significant. The letter, a white leprous spot, lay upon the dirty tiles of the hall. My dear Gloria, we had the test run off yesterday afternoon, and Mr. Debris seemed to think that for the part he had in mind he needed a younger woman. He said that the acting was not bad, and there was a small character part supposed to be a very haughty rich widow that he thought you might— Desolately, Gloria raised her glance until it fell out across the areaway. But she found she could not see the opposite wall, for her gray eyes were full of tears. She walked into the bedroom, the letter crinkled tightly in her hand, and sank down upon her knees before the long mirror on the wardrobe floor. This was her twenty-ninth birthday, and the world was melting away before her eyes. She tried to think that it had been the make-up, but her emotions were too profound, too overwhelming, for any consolation that the thought conveyed. She strained to see until she could feel the flesh on her temples pull forward. Yes, the cheeks were ever so faintly thin, the corners of the eyes were lined with tiny wrinkles. The eyes were different. Why, they were different. And then, suddenly, she knew how tired her eyes were. "'Oh, my pretty face!' she whispered, passionately grieving. "'Oh, my pretty face! Oh, I don't want to live without my pretty face! Oh, what's happened?' Then she slid toward the mirror and, as in the test, sprawled face downward upon the floor and lay there sobbing. It was the first awkward movement she had ever made. End of Book 3, Chapter 2, Part 2 of 2